Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres, from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah, and this is our last episode of 2019. It is New Year's Eve, and yes, I'm doing a podcast because I am old and boring. <laughs> we we actually had uh, possible plans for tonight, my husband and I, but we have now opted to stay home and possibly go to bed early. We may be up at midnight. I mean, wow, I really can't. I, I, I'm really sounding old right now. Uh, I'm okay with that, but just just talking about it, saying, you know, like, we may just go to bed early or maybe we'll sit on the couch and watch TV or something. I don't know. It, but I'm I'm a major introvert, so it's okay. The party would have been fun, but it would have been... I don't know, a couple hundred people. And um, so there's different kinds of fun. There's the fun of hanging out with a couple hundred people and, and dancing and drinking champagne and kissing your hubby at midnight. Or there's the fun of already being in your jammies and um, maybe still drinking champagne and kissing your hubby at midnight. Or maybe being asleep with your hubby and the dogs. <laughs> anyway. It's an interview day. It's Tuesday. So I have a returning guest with me on the podcast today. Debbie Burke was on the podcast a while back to talk about the first book in her series that stars uh, Tawny Lindholm. These books are um, suspense, a little bit of thriller, a little bit of mystery. Uh, Tawny, as I said, is the main character. And one thing that I love about this series is that it's set in Montana. Not only Montana, but Western Montana and very near to my hometown. So as I probably mentioned last time, I get this silly sort of thrill when I'm reading the books and, um, you know, at the very, the very beginning, the main character, Tawny, is driving somewhere and she's, there's a reference to her being 10 miles outside of Glacier National Park. And I'm like, Hey, I know where that is. Honestly, 10 miles outside of Glacier National Park could be any number of places. <laughs> And I don't know specifically what she was referring to or if this is, you know, even a real place or if it's just fictional, but I don't care because I'm like, I've been 10 miles outside of Glacier National Park many, many times. This is my, this, this is my home. This is my, this is my happy place. So it just always makes me super happy to read her books because, you know, they are, they are fun. They are suspenseful, but they're also set in Montana. And I love that. And I love to talk to Debbie about um, the books and she is a transplanted, uh, Californian. She grew up in California and now lives in Montana, whereas I grew up in Montana and now live in California. So I am very jealous of our role reversal. At any rate, the second book in this Tawny Lindholm series is called Stalking Midas and the description is as follows. Charming con artist Cassandra Maza has cornered her prey, Mo Rosenbaum, an addled millionaire with nine cats, until investigator Tawny Lindholm disrupts the scam. Tawny suspects elder fraud and won't stop digging until she finds the truth. Cassandra can't allow that. She's killed before, and each time it's easier. Tawny will be next. Okay, first off, I like that it's a crazy cat dude instead of a crazy cat lady. <laughs> It doesn't have to be a crazy person, but you know, people with many cats are often referred to as crazy. Hey, if you love cats and you're not allergic to them, more power to you. I am allergic to them, so I cannot have nine cats or one cat. At any rate, I like that it's a crazy cat dude instead of a crazy cat lady. But one thing that I really appreciate about Debbie's books is that her main characters are not in their 20s. Tawny is in her 50s. She is widowed. We learned about her late husband in the first book. And there is a, a friendship, possibly a burgeoning... No, 
it, there is a, a, a burgeoning romance in this book. Uh, I am not really giving too, too much away because you can tell as you're, as you're reading through it. And also Debbie mentions it in the interview. And, you, you know, he's no spring chicken either. And so you don't often see as many main characters who are middle aged and older, especially not having romances. So I like that you get that representation because of course, as much fun as our twenties are and as much fun as it is to, you know, read romances where all the characters are 28 or whatever, it's nice to see other age groups represented in more than just secondary characters. And so I very much appreciate that. And I mean, Mo, the character is in his nineties, I think. I can't remember exactly his age but he is oh he's he's a curmudgeon he i know so many mo's <laughs> and he is just he's he's grumpy he's curmudgeonly he uh and yet tawny manages to kind of work around him and, and become his friend so i'm going to stop waxing rhapsodic about montana and about this book and i'm gonna let Debbie talk about her book so that she can give you her perspective on it rather than me yammering on and on. So let's go ahead and get to the interview with author Debbie Burke about her new novel called Stalking Midas. Hi, Debbie. Welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me back. I am really excited to chat with you again. We are going to talk about the second book in uh, the series that we started talking about the first time you were on the show. But uh, before we get to that, if you could, um, for people who maybe didn't hear the first show or need a refresher, just tell a little bit about yourself. Okay. Um, I was born in San Diego, and I uh, grew up uh, devouring Nancy Drew, Sherlock Holmes, Ian Fleming, you know, Alfred Hitchcock and Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine. So I, you know, became a, a great uh, lover of mystery, suspense, thriller, and that's the writing that I got into. Um, uh, my first rejection was for a script for the Man from Uncle TV show in the mid 1960s. Uh, you probably don't remember that, but maybe your mother does. <laughs> but it was um, I submitted that to to them, handwritten on a three ring, you know, line binder paper and um, got a very nice rejection back from them saying they didn't accept anything that didn't come through an agent. So it was pretty, pretty good for a teenage, you know, teenage kid who didn't know any better. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I um, graduated from University of California at San Diego with a degree in literature. um, But my real life career was mostly in home building, property management um, and other businesses where The only thing that degree was very useful for was uh, I could write a great business letter. (laughs) However, um, (laughs) after selling our businesses, uh, my husband and I moved uh, out of the big city to a small town in Montana. And that's when I started getting back into writing and uh, uh, especially writing fiction and have been right at it full time ever since. Wonderful. Well, it's, I know it is something that you love, so it's, it's good to hear that you have gotten to it and that you're, you're enjoying this new phase of your career. Um, so since this is a series, let's start with the first book, which is called Instrument of the Devil. If you could just give a brief overview of that, because that's where we are introduced to Tawny, the main character. Sure, sure. Um, I'd written a number of mysteries over a couple of decades, and um, I'm really good at collecting rejection slips. Um, I I excel at that. <laughs> so anyway, uh, <laughs> Instrument of the Devil was uh, probably my 10th or 11th book, but it was the first one that actually was published. Um, and that was in 2017. And I was, of course, over the moon. And then six months later, the publisher shut down and I became an orphan, which happens to a lot of writers. It, it's almost a badge of courage, you know, <laughs> a badge of honor that you you've survived and endured so have written a lot of nonfiction articles magazine articles and uh so i was used to uh magazines going out of business uh you know as they collapsed in the 
the 90s and early 2000s. So, so I'm pretty used to being an orphan and you learn you just have to keep writing and looking for other avenues and outlets. The Instrument of the Devil uh, introduced my main character, Tawny Lindholm, uh, who's a 50-year-old widow who was born and raised in Kalispell, Montana. And like many small-town folks, she's a very trusting person. And she uh, gets swept into a romance with a handsome terrorist. And he sets her up as a scapegoat in his plot to destroy the electrical grid. His target is the Hungry Horse Dam, where Tawny works, and his weapon is a rigged smartphone, which is the instrument of the devil. And that's uh, that's the first book. I'm going to jump in here so we can take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, uh, we'll be talking a little bit about why else the book is called The Instrument of the Devil. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. Before the break, Debbie and I were talking about her first Tawny Lindholm novel, which was about um, a lot of things, terrorism, cell phones, <laughs> the instrument of the devil. And there is, as I said before the break, another reason that she named this book Instrument of the Devil. So let's go ahead and get back to that interview and find out why. Okay, and um, and it's, it's also the instrument of the devil because it, it drives Tawny absolutely crazy. <laughs> she has more, and, and my more issues that, with her smartphone then. <laughs> and that part is entirely autobiographical. <laughs> I, I have to confess, my smartphone continues to to uh, make my life miserable. And uh, uh, but you know, it's it's one of those things that the necessary evils that you have to live with in the current right. world. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, just I do find a lot of people, and surprisingly, even younger people um, who still are struggling with them, and still, you know, just makes their life crazy. And so, I think a lot of that that theme resonates with a lot of readers that you know, just aren't quite used to technology and it does things that they don't expect and it does things they don't want it to do. Uh, but, you know, they still have to keep struggling with it. So. Right, right. Yes, I, I know my sister feels very similarly. So it's, it's <laughs> across generations. Right, so right. that. That is where we learned, or we we met Tawny, and um, I think we and she learned that she is um, a lot stronger and more capable than she might have expected. So what's going on with Tawny in the second book? It is called Stalking Midas. Okay. Um, At the end of Instrument of the Devil, um, she meets a very brash, bombastic attorney named Tillman Rosenbaum, who saves her from criminal charges. And uh, in Stalking Midas, uh, Tawny is now working as an investigator for Tillman. And she doesn't much like him, but she feels very indebted to him and very grateful for the job. And the the uh, story problem in Stalking Midas is Tillman is estranged from his father, Mo, who's a secretive, eccentric millionaire who has nine cats. And Tillman suspects his dad is being scammed financially, but the two men refuse to talk to each other. So he sends Tawny to find out what's going on with his dad. And the inspiration for this story is... Um, 
basically elder fraud. Uh, I've known a number of older people who've been victimized by con artists, including my own adopted mother. Uh, and elder fraud is a crime that's extremely common, but very underreported because the victims are uh, ashamed and embarrassed. Uh, if you've handed over thousands of dollars to someone you later learn is a thief, you don't want anybody to find out about that. Uh, and as a result of this fear of revealing the being victimized, uh, the criminals keep getting away with stealing and uh, they just move on to their next victim. And in addition, uh, with seniors, they often are suffering from dementia and other medical problems that make them especially vulnerable to scammers. So that kind of was my, my theme for this, uh, this book was the dangers of elder fraud. Right, and we know right away from the from the very first pages of the book that this is um, this particular villain is going is is going to go beyond even just fraud. So we know that there are uh, lots of dangers in store for Tawny as she gets involved in this investigation. Um, how do you feel that Tawny has changed as a character since the first book? Um, she was very naive in Instrument of the Devil, and she almost gets killed because she trusted the wrong guy. Um, but she has now gotten a little more wary, uh, a little more savvy. Um, and in Stalking Midas, though, she does, uh, she is dyslexic and doesn't have much education, so she always feels very over her head. Uh, and in this new job, um, she's got to deal with her boss, Tillman, who is a very successful, high-powered attorney, and he's very demanding. And even though Tanya is smart and intuitive, she still lacks confidence, and she's struggling constantly to do a good job. And the, her assignment is Tillman's dad, Mo, uh, is to find out about what's going on with him. And Mo is a secretive, abrasive 75-year-old who stubbornly resists Tawny's attempts to help him, but she refuses to give up on him. And while they're out cross-country skiing, she is very courageous and rescues him from a stalking mountain lion that is after him. Uh, and that's kind of the turning point in their relationship because she saved his life. Mo begins to trust her and they form an uneasy uh, friendship. Mm -hmm. And it's it's kind of funny because you know at the beginning of the book you you, you really find out that um that that Mo and his son uh, Tillman are do not really have a relationship they haven't spoken um and yet um he sends Tawny to go <laughs> deal with this man that he refuses to deal with <laughs> right. And, <laughs> Right. And she does right. because through a combination of, you know, kind of guilt and um because she's a good person. <laughs> right, right. She she rises to the occasion no matter how crummy the occasion may be. And so ahead, your inspiration for this story was it was the elder fraud. Is that correct? Was that your jumping off point for the story or did you um, have something else? Yeah, actually, the the germ of the idea uh, came from a uh, I did I did was doing a lot of research into elder fraud for um, magazine articles I was writing, and I went to a lot of uh, seminars and uh, you know put on by the AARP and law enforcement, and that's where I learned that scammers target people in the places that they are the most vulnerable. Um, they gain the trust of the victim by using something that the victim loves. And in this case, Mo doesn't like people very much, but he's got a real soft spot uh, to his nine rescued cats. And uh, so this is the avenue through which the villain gets to him where he's vulnerable. Uh, and the villain is a beautiful middle-aged woman who charms and flatters him, and she's exploiting his love for his cats as a way to get to his money. Uh, and the the germ of the idea actually came from an advertisement I saw in a senior publication, and it read, um, if something happens to you, who will take care of your beloved pet? 
And that got my devious mystery writer's mind thinking, what if a con artist sets up what appears to be a legitimate nonprofit sanctuary for pets? Um, and in this case, the, the villain targets well-to-do people who love their pets but don't have a good relationship with their children. Um, the uh, seniors worry that their beloved Muffy or Rover is going to get dumped at the pound after they die. So uh, this con artist uh, sells them annuities for this pet sanctuary that she's supposedly building. And she's promising luxury accommodations, vet care, food, lots of love. And uh, the only hitch is the sanctuary doesn't exist, except in phony photographs that she shows to prospective investors. And at the point that Tawny comes into the story, uh, the villain has milked Mo for over a million dollars. Um, and then Tawny starts poking around and the villain realizes her her gravy train is in danger so she starts going after tawny that's where the fireworks get going (laughs) yes that's one thing that i love about my time with debbie when we are able to do interviews because we just have a good time and we laugh a lot and that makes me happy so we're going to take our second break of the podcast when we come back more with debbie so stay tuned you're listening to the gsmc book review podcast and i'll be right back tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts now listen close and hear this out there's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. Hey! The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch, whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking with author Debbie Burke today. And before the break, we were talking about how her new novel, Stalking Midas, came about from some real life experience and from some seminars that she attended. And the inspiration was, of course, uh, the issue of elder fraud. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that. Let's get back to the interview. So obviously, you 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 know you came into this from a uh, from doing some seminars, doing some work like, like that, what other research did you then do to flesh out the story? Um, actually, I know, you know, as I say, I, I know from personal experience a number of people who were, uh, you know, have been scammed. And so from each one of them, I have learned, you know, a little aspect here or there about um, kind of the psychology of the elderly victim. And that's that's very interesting because one of the big factors that seniors feel um, is they are aware, they are afraid of losing control of their money. If they get scammed, they're worried their kids are going to come in and say, hey, you can't take care of yourself anymore. We're taking over your money. So it's a big issue of loss of control and autonomy for many seniors. And so that was uh, the kind of the psychology of how scammers can use that against uh, elderly people uh, was very interesting to me and very interesting to explore in a fictional way. And because um, generally the the older generation, uh, for instance, Mo is 75, you know, so he's... Um, uh, old enough to still have that sense of uh, pride and independence 
um, that the the greatest generation had, and uh, and he does not want to be dependent on anyone. Uh, he wants to maintain his own, um, you know, his own life, and the rest of the world be damned. And uh, <clears throat> this is something that happened with my adopted mother in real life. She was uh, ninety plus years old and still living in her own home and very independent, refused to move in with either my sister or me. Um, and the way that she was scammed was uh, we wanted, we were concerned about her because, you know, she was 90 something years old. And so we had uh, a, a caregiver, a visiting caregiver come in and, you know, set up her medications and take her shopping and things like that. Uh, because neither my sister nor I lived in San Diego where, where my mother was. Um, and so uh, the caregiver had good references. However, uh, we found out later that she had been taking care of my mother's sister and had been stealing from her and then started stealing from my mother, but nobody knew about it until after the sister and my mother's sister died, and then my mother died. And we uh, we discovered the hard way that she had uh, been using my mother's credit cards and running up automatic charges on her bank account and things like this. So it was um, a real uh, eye-opener. Uh, and the... The other thing that was very shocking was the uh, difficulty of prosecuting people. We had all kinds of proof, uh, you know, charges, unauthorized charges from uh, Discover and Visa. We had uh, text messages from the caregiver saying, oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. I'll pay back all the money I owe you. We had all this evidence proving, you know, and uh, having the, the thief admit that she'd done it. However, once my mother died, the police dropped the investigation because they said she's not alive to testify. And that oh my was gosh. A, yeah, that was a huge shock. Uh, so, uh, and we, you know, did more research among more victims. And for instance, my sister works uh, for the LA County court system and her own judge, um, uh, his brother was victimized in a similar way. And again, once, uh, once the victim dies, the prosecution drops because they aren't available to testify. So oh, wow, I had was, no idea. That, was, that is crazy. Uh, we were we were just utterly shocked. We couldn't believe it. So I yeah. have been doing you know writing uh, you know writing articles about that to alert people uh, because it is a uh, you know it, you don't find out about these things until you actually go through them yourself, and um, mm -hmm. it's a real it's a real eye opener and a real shocker about how pervasive elder fraud is and how easily people can get away with it. If you don't get caught and prosecuted, uh, hey, you just go on to your next victim. There's no deterrent. Right. Wow. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, why, why, why stop if you can, if you right, can keep getting away right. with it? Right. So um, that, you know, I had finished writing Stalking Midas at the time my mother was victimized. Um, but I went back and rewrote parts of it to incorporate some of these lessons that I had learned from the real life experience. Um, so that's, uh, you know, it, it's something that's close to my heart. It's a, it's a subject that's close to my heart that people are, are vulnerable and uh, not as, uh, not as able to protect themselves as they were as younger people. And uh, I just think it's a, a terrible, you know, terrible crime for um, uh, predators to prey on elderly people. Right, right. And I know that you know you can't you can't go back and and fix what happened with your mother. But um, <clears throat> excuse me, did you feel any sort of did 
was there any sort of catharsis with the writing of this? You know, as and you'd already finished it, but then you went back. Did it did it help at all? Actually, um, not so much that, but I have been giving talks, you know, public service talks to uh, senior groups since that came out. You know, since I published the book, and. I feel um, good about doing that because it's something where I can warn other people who are in in the risk pool, you know, in the in the uh, category of, of uh, easy prey, and uh, I think that has maybe done a little bit of good where people hear hear me telling them about the some of the warning signs to watch out for and ways that they can protect themselves and some of the shocking things like, hey, if, uh, you know, even though you have evidence, if the victim dies, the prosecution is dropped. And so I think people uh, appreciate that they can, uh, they're better off protecting themselves and preventing it from happening rather than trying to react fraud after the fact when it's too late. So that's right. the message I've been trying to get out with uh, with both the um, uh, articles I've been writing for senior publications and also for uh, the, the talks that I've been giving to groups. Mm-hmm. So that kind of helps me, you know, helps me feel like I'm doing something about the problem. Right. Um, in terms of writing, since this is the second in a series, did you find the writing, was it a different process in any way for you or kind of the same? Well, um, because I've written a number of books and this is actually, I think, the third series of books that I've uh, written, um, it's the part that is most fun for me is you get to know the main characters better with each book. Um, it's kind of like getting to know people in real life. Over time, you hear more stories from them. You learn more about their backgrounds and what their past experiences are. And <clears throat> that's something that the, the characters continue to develop with each new book they get into a different situation that challenges them and brings up past experiences that uh you know they they draw from in order to deal with the problem um uh for when i started out uh writing stalking midas i didn't know yet that tawny had a grandfather with dementia who was swindled out of the family farm and but that somehow that backstory started bubbling up from my subconscious, and that uh, as it developed, that provided a stronger motivation for why Tawny is so um, determined to help Mo and refuses to give up on him, even though he's got a terrible temper and he doesn't cooperate when she tries to help him. Um, and he starts out as a work assignment for her, but becomes someone she truly cares about and wants to help because that's kind of her, she couldn't help her grandfather, but this is a a way of redemption where she can try and help Mo. Okay, third break of the podcast. And when we come back, we'll be talking a little bit about the third book of the series, which is coming out in just a few weeks. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast, the show that gives you advice on everything travel. We explore places you've always wanted to go, as well as giving tips for traveling in those places. We'll give you advice on the best sites for travel tips, information, and discounts. Join us as we travel the world, explore cultures, and meet new people. The Golden State Media Concepts Travel Podcast has got you covered. Download the GSMC Travel Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking, of course, with author Debbie Burke, 
We have been talking about her Tawny Lindholm's series, and we are now going to talk a little bit about the upcoming third novel in that series. Let's get back to the interview. And speaking of writing series, the third mm-hmm. book in the series comes out in January, which is very cool. So yeah. um, what can you tell us about that book without, you know, giving too much away from the future? <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks for asking. I appreciate that. And yes, I'm um, uh, looking forward to, to getting that one released. Um, uh, the This one is a little different um, in that the first two books were set in the Flathead Valley of Montana. Uh, and Eyes in the Sky it takes place in Billings, Montana, on the Rim Rocks. Uh-huh. And uh, the Rim Rocks are a bunch of sheer sandstone cliffs that rise hundreds of feet above the city of Billings and they are a world famous destination for rock climbers and uh, of course being sheer cliffs they're a perfect setting for a murder <laughs> so so that was um, that's uh, kind of fun in a different uh, you know different location um, that and now I do have to give her a, a, that I saw Right, right, yeah. <laughs> now, I do have to give a spoiler alert here because um, in Stalking Midas, Tawny and uh, her boss, Tillman, spend most of the book butting heads while trying to avoid their attraction to each other. And here's mm-hmm. the spoiler. In the end, they wind up in a personal relationship together, uh, even though they both know it's felony stupid for an employee to become involved with the boss. But, <laughs> right. Uh, <they> do, <laughs> Especially a cranky <laughs> boss like Tillman. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but they do care deeply for each other, but um, but their relationship is not going to go smoothly. And so in the third book, that uh, I start exploring some of that. Um, uh, Tillman brings Tawny to his home in Billings to get better acquainted with his three troubled teenagers. And uh, uh, while she's there, his oldest daughter attempts suicide, and Tawny saves the girl's life. And that causes no end of problems with this toxic ex-wife who's jealous that Tawny gets along better with the kids than they do with their own mother. So there's uh, plenty of uh, plenty of intrigue going on there. And then on top of family problems, there's an enemy gunning for Tillman trying to ruin his law practice and break him financially. So the, the, mm-hmm. uh, those are the problems that tangle up in eyes in the sky. <laughs> I, I think that Tawny should just stop leaving the house. <laughs> <laughs> but then it, w- it wouldn't be any fun to write books about her <laughs> right, staying right. home. <laughs> <laughs> right. you have to, the series you would you be very to, boring. <laughs> right. You have to get your poor per- your characters. You might like them, but you have to keep getting them in trouble in order to make right. a book right. that's worth reading. So, yes. <laughs> so you just torture them no end. <laughs> do you have um do you have a, a a number in mind for the number of books in the series or are you just gonna keep writing as things come to you? Well actually I'm wrapping up the fourth book right now and it's a little change of pace because it is set in Florida uh and uh during Hurricane Irma and <clears throat> that uh Tony and Tillman are on vacation visiting Tillman's old high school bas- baseball coach. And uh, the coach was essentially a surrogate father to Tillman, so they're they're quite close. Um, however, the coach has a serious gambling problem and uh, vanishes during Hurricane Irma. And so they spend much of the book searching for him uh, through floods and no electricity and snakes that are swimming around and, uh, you know, just all kinds of hardships that are a result of Hurricane Irma. And the mystery is, did he disappear on purpose to escape his gambling debts, or was he abducted and murdered? So that's that's kind of the crux of that story. Okay. Um, so fourth, the, the fourth book is in the works. Um, yeah. You also 
Right. Well, I have to say that uh, you keep moving further and further away from Kalispell, and this is making me sad, <laughs> Debbie. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, actually, my my husband was in Florida during Hurricane Irma, and uh, oh, good experience. The yeah, experienced the the full wrath of it. The eye went right over the the condominium building where he was, and so it's uh, it was too. Um, <sighs> too unique and interesting experience not to not to take advantage of in a fictional way so and uh sure. you know, I have a lot of friends who who survived Irma and it was a, a huge uh impact to the all of Florida and uh it's when something like that happens and you have no phones, you have no electricity, you have no ref, uh, refrigeration, no gasoline, no no nothing it really uh brings out the worst in people but also in some ways the best in people so it's it's an interesting situation to explore uh fictionally so so it's uh i'll i'll wind up back in montana for sure because i'm a montana <laughs> girl but but i had to i had to take advantage of of uh you know the the interesting things that happened uh uh, during Irma. Yeah, absolutely. Um, are you still writing for the Kill Zone? I am. I am. Um, that's a lot of fun. I really enjoy doing that. There, are, uh, uh, it's about a dozen mystery, suspense, and crime authors, and we rotate right in. It's a daily blog um, that comes out with posts every day. Uh, about the various aspects of writing. And although it's got a focus on crime fiction, there are a lot of interesting, helpful tips for any genre of writing. So um, it's been named by Writer's Digest as one of the 101 best websites for writers. And that has been awarded that, uh, geez, I don't know, many years in a row. So it's it's a very... Um, fun, interesting, helpful site. Um, I like to say I got my MFA for free from what I learned at the Kill Zone when I was re a reader uh, and not <laughs> not a contributor. So, so And um, in addition to my regular Tuesday posts that I write every other Tuesday, um, I started a monthly feature called True Crime Thursday that spotlights unusual crimes that past and present. Um, and that's kind of fun to, to dig up some of these strange, strange crimes that, you know, you, you couldn't make this stuff up. <laughs> so, um, for instance, for Thanksgiving, I wrote about actual cases of turkey theft, including the, there was a story <laughs> about a couple of, yeah, <laughs> a couple of goofballs who stole live birds from a farm and stuffed them in the trunk of their car and tried to escape. And when the cops caught up to them, the guys were trying to get rid of the evidence by shooing the birds away and turning them loose, but um, they were still there were still a couple of turkeys stuck in the truck, so they were they were convicted. <laughs> so, but as a result of, of of that crime, it became a felony in North Dakota to steal turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> so you just you can't make this stuff up. No, you, you know? can't. And and I'm just I'm just imagining opening that trunk with many many really really angry turkeys. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Right. Oh wow, that that sounds like a lot of fun, um, but yeah, also crazy. It, it, I mean, the writing sounds really fun, not the fun. stealing of turkeys. <laughs> <laughs> right. It is fun. And, you know, of course, some of the cases are unsolved mysteries that are very, you know, very tragic cases. But then you run across something like this crazy turkey theft and it just makes you smile. You know, you can't help yeah. but get a, get a good laugh out of it. <laughs> so. Exactly. So you ever hear those laws or you, you find out about a law in a certain place and you're like, there has to be a story behind that. Well, in this case, there is a story behind the turkeys and the law and turkeys in a trunk just seems like a really bad idea. Turkeys in a trunk, though, could be a bad movie. Sounds like a really bad uh, band name. Could be all kinds of things. Let's go ahead and take our last break of the podcast. 
Then we come back, we'll be talking about Debbie's work with the Flathead Writers Group. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC po- uh, Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. The GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast takes you on a journey of exploration. We'll discuss tried and true methods alongside the latest trends of how to best live your life to its fullest and happiest. From psychology to meditation, science to self-help books, the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast will help you to discover what makes you happy and how you can live life being the best you possible. Download the GSMC Life and Happiness Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere where you find podcasts just type gsmc in the search bar Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with author Debbie Burke. Um, I know you're also involved with um, uh, the authors of the Flathead group. Are, is there anything coming up with that group that you would like to highlight? Oh, as a matter of fact, yeah. Um, our annual writing conference um, is September 19th and 20th in 2020, and that takes place in Kalispell, Montana, and it's our 30th anniversary. So we're pulling out all the stops to celebrate. Uh, so if anyone is looking for a really fun, friendly, reasonably priced gathering, please check out the Flathead River Writers Conference. And it's... Uh, going to be a good time we always pack a lot of very uh it's very information and education oriented but also a lot of fun and i'll just say if you want to go somewhere beautiful in september kalispell is not a bad place to go you can't beat it you can visit glacier park uh uh which you know the colors are gorgeous and uh it's just a uh a fun vacation as well as a, an educational opportunity. And so we have a lot of, a lot of our attendees who come back year after year and they, uh, usually tack on a few days before or after the conference and go out and do some sightseeing and enjoying, enjoying Montana in the fall. Mm-hmm. That's wonderful. So what in all of your free time, uh, you know, because it sounds like you have so much of it, um, what, have you, what have you been reading? Um, actually, I uh, have been reading several mystery uh, mysteries from uh, some of the authors of The Kill Zone, who, you know, my blog mates on The Kill Zone. Uh, one of them is Jordan Dane. Another one is P.J. Parrish. Um, uh, 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 James Scott Bell, uh, John Gilstrap. And so it's kind of fun to read the books that where I, I've never met these people face to face, yet we know each other as, you know, as contributors on the kill zone. So, so I've been reading uh, a number of their books lately and that's, that's kind of fun. Um, uh, I also, uh, do, uh, I'm judging for the, uh, Pikes Peak Writers Conference uh, contest right now. So I'm reading uh, some manuscript uh, excerpts that are entries in the contest and uh, actually ran across one that is as good a book, uh, at least the the excerpt I've read, read uh, is as good a book as anything I've read published or unpublished in years. And uh, so I'm hoping that that will be a winner that will uh, you know, will wind up being published, and I'll and I'll get to read the entire thing. So, oh, wonderful! I was being kind of silly when uh, we first started talking before we mm-hmm. were recording, and I I was saying, mm-hmm. so how is reading different in Florida than it is in Montana? Because <laughs> you're currently <laughs> in Florida, um, and you said you actually have more free time right now, so you have been able to read a little more. Right, right, and um, it's just it's. Uh, it's reading for fun. A lot of what I read uh, is I'm either editing it or beta reading for another author or um, doing research. Uh, you know, so so this is my Florida reading time is my fun 
uh, beach reads, if you will. <laughs> you know, I, I get to uh, get to read stuff that I, I normally wouldn't uh, have time to read, even though I'd like to read more of it. Yeah, I totally get the having time to read. Um, there's a difference between reading, you know, reading stuff that you need to read that you still enjoy and is fun, but also the things that are on your personal to be read list uh, sometimes right. go by the wayside. Yeah, right. My my yep. poor Kindle, the the shelves on my poor Kindle are sagging under the weight of all the books <laughs> that I haven't gotten to yet. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, nice. I just got a, a, a Amazon gift card for Christmas, so I'm gonna be be out buying more books <laughs> to, to stuff onto my poor Kindle. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if nice. only there was time to read. <laughs> read them. Right, right. But it, it's much easier to take all those books with you to Florida than you know ha- exactly. if you had to pack them all. So that's nice. Exactly. I I do I yeah. do like the Kindle for that because you you know you can put 500 books on there and not have them cluttering up the bookshelves and and I I still like paper books um, but for practical reasons I really do like the Kindle uh, a lot. Yeah. And, uh, I agree. But I'm finding uh, you know uh, my a lot of my readers are. Uh, older generation, you know, 50 and above. And um, I'm finding that they, a great many of them do prefer the print paperback book. And the other surprising thing I'm finding is I um, I do some work with uh, school kids, you know, helping with their writing. And uh, just uh, recently talked to um, a group of eighth graders who were doing NaNoWriMo. And in case your uh, listeners don't know, NaNoWriMo is National Novel Writing Month, and the uh, purpose of it is uh, people try and write a draft of a novel in 30 days during the month of November. And so um, I was talking with you know with a group of eighth graders uh, who were participating in NaNoWriMo, which I think is just a great teaching tool for uh, you know, reading and writing students. Uh, but they, so many of them are liking the physical book and would prefer to read a physical book rather than read on their devices. And so it's kind of interesting the, watching the cycles go as, as far as what is, what was popular. Then, of course, the, you know, the print print books were going to be all obsolete. Everybody was going to be reading on an electronic device. And then, of course, now print books are starting to come back. Uh, and uh, being appreciated by younger generations, it's not just us old fogies who like, you know, who like the paper book. So, right, um, that, right, nice. That, yeah, that's an interesting, uh, interesting phenomenon. Yeah, and, and, and I, it I like makes, it, me, makes me hopeful, too. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I agree. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know that you have a website. So if you could tell people um, how to find your website and if you are on any social media. Okay, sure. Um, my website is com, and it's all one word, D-E-B-B-I-E-B-U-R-K-E-W-R-I-T-E-R.com. And <clears throat> that is where I uh, put announcements of new books that are coming out and uh, uh, people can read excerpts of the books that I've written uh, on there, see if they're interested. Um, <clears throat> my books are available on Amazon in Kindle and paperback. Um, I'm on Facebook as Debbie Burke Writer and I'm on Twitter as uh, under at Burke underscore writer. So um, that's um, I'm not terribly into Facebook and Twitter um, because I do spend a lot of time uh, on uh, blogging on the Kill Zone, um, but I do I do sometimes put links to my Kill Zone posts on Facebook and Twitter. Okay, thank you so much for that. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you were hoping to cover during our time together? Not really. You ask very, very good questions, uh, and it's 
you know, so it's always fun to talk with you. Um, people who are who are aspiring writers just say, "Don't give up." <laughs> you know, because I'm one of those people that <clears throat> you know was only 30 years to overnight success. So, you know, that's um, <laughs> it's it's the it's the persistence and staying with it that uh, that gets you through uh, being a writer. Uh, in spite of all the disappointments like publishers going out of business and magazines folding, um, you just keep writing because you love it and uh, uh, you can't help yourself. <laughs> so, so uh, you know, the only way I, I have a, a dear friend and mentor, Dennis Foley, who says you can't fail at writing. You can only stop, you know, stop trying. And I think that's very, very good um advice for not only writing but life yeah absolutely well debbie it's always fun to talk to you and i really appreciate you taking the time and especially this week after christmas so um thank you so much for joining me again on the podcast well thank you sarah it's always a pleasure talking with you well, one quick question is when in january does the third book come out um i believe it's january 23rd uh is okay the, the estimated date so okay perfect thank you thank you again to debbie for joining me on the weekend after christmas the weekend before new year's eve um if it sounds like it ended sort of abruptly there it did and it didn't the rest of the recording was just us chatting about all sorts of different things and you don't probably need to hear us chatting about all sorts of different things. I had a good time and I hope Debbie had a good time, but probably not something that needs to be added to the podcast. So you just get the book stuff and some of the other silly stuff, but not the, uh, Ooh, let's talk about Montana stuff. You get enough of that from me, right? Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much to Debbie. Thank you as always to you, my listeners, for joining me. I am so happy to be a part of your lives and have you be a part of mine. As always, if you enjoy the show, please do us the solid of um, giving us a nice review, whether written or just a nice five-star review. Either way, it really helps us out. Also, follow us on social media. Comment on the um, on the posts uh, or on the on the podcasts. Is there any author that you love who would you who you'd love to hear on the podcast, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. Just interact. Love to hear from you. Follow us. Retweet do all those wonderful social media type things that help a podcast out. In the meantime, I hope that you have a wonderful, safe, happy New Year's. Whether you're staying home on your couch, or you're going out and doing something fun and fancy, be safe. And, um, you know, I'd say get lost in a good book. That's more if you're staying home on the couch. <laughs> if you're going out to something fancy, maybe try to stay in the moment. But if you need to sit in the corner with a book, I'm totally on board with that as well. Happy New Year's, and I'll talk to you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from Move to music, from sports, to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.